What does it mean for a thing to be systemic? If you asked an astrophysicist, they might tell you that it's something that describes a whole system. The systemic velocity of a galaxy, for example, describes how the center of mass of a galaxy is moving, as opposed to the orbital motions of its stars or the infalling movement of its gases. Trust me, I used to be one, that's exactly what we would say. However, as is usually the case, the astrophysical take is not particularly useful to most people here. I think most of the time when people say something systemic, Systemic, they mean in the socio-political way, right? Systems of oppression or systemic change, dismantling systems. Like the kinds of things I talk about in my other videos where I read scientific institutions for filth. But here's the thing with talking about systemic issues on the internet, everybody's gonna ask you how to fix it. Like just casually, cool talk, so how do we change the system? What are your like top 10 tips for radically restructuring this centuries-old international driven by political, military, economic, social interests thing that is science. First off, flattered. The amount some people overestimate my knowledge will never cease to amaze me. But eventually, when the internet stranger validation fades, I'm left with the hugeness and impossibility of that question. How are we supposed to change anything? The systemic issues that hurt most people in society, they're massive, they're historic, they're powerful, they're far-reaching, ever-evolving, unfathomably complicated. And, and I'm just one individual, like, what am I supposed to do about anything? How can an individual even affect systemic change? Like, what would that even mean? I don't I don't even know if I know what that means anymore. Like, what does it mean to change a system? How am I supposed to do a thing where I don't even understand? All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is changed. So why am I making a video about this instead of dark matter or whatever other imaginary thing people like to hear astronomers talk about? I want to address two points that come up in my comments a lot and are fair but not necessarily practical to engage with in every single discussion of any social influence in science. First is the person who just doesn't believe systemic oppression is a thing. I've sometimes started from the premise that systems like patriarchy or white supremacy exist, and some people apparently take issue with these premises. So today, I will humor that response. Really break down the starting assumption that systems of oppression are a thing that exists and have the capacity to affect, for example, who become scientists. And hopefully, I won't have to justify this point again, meaning I just won't. But I imagine a lot of you already understand how significant a feature in our society systemic oppression is, and are interested in hearing more than just the zero order version of this conversation. Which brings me to the second kind of response I always get. The person who asks me how we can fix STEM as if it's a real question someone can just answer. For that person, I want to... Perhaps not answer, but at least start to unpack that question. Because while, for reasons we'll get into later, I don't believe there's a clear-cut answer, I can at least share how I've come to think about systemic change in a way that's personally helped me manage that sense of doom that one seems to permanently acquire when they learn about the problems of the world. The Weltschmerz as the Germans call it. So yeah, I'm gonna try to do both of those things in one go. Convince the skeptics that systems of oppression are real and bad, and convince the doomers that despite that, 
There is hope, actually. Which seems like a lot, but in all fairness, I'm pretty good at this. Today's will be a show in two acts. In act one, we'll break down a case study to generalize from. The underrepresentation of black people in American STEM education. Anti-blackness is of course not the only kind of systemic oppression that exists, and education is not the only context in which it operates. But again, it's a case study. In act two, we'll start thinking about solutions. Or at least start thinking about thinking about solutions. You'll see what I mean. We'll hear from some people, look at some examples, and share some resources in a way that's hopefully more productive than overwhelming. Not a lot of science in this one, y'all, but subscribe and hit the bell so you get notified when I put out this other video I'm working on about how dark matter isn't real. It's gonna be a banger. <laughs> So where is this system everyone keeps talking about? So there's this thing in the United States where STEM higher education is really bad at recruiting and retaining students that aren't white or Asian, and this is across disciplines and gets worse with level of education. In an effort to understand this problem, some people came up with a model called the leaky pipeline. The visual is a pipe with several connection points representing transitions between different stages of education and or professional training, and at each juncture, water is leaking out. As a result of these leaks, there is less and less metaphorical water available at each subsequent stage. So when we look, for example, at the fact that less than 2% of chemistry professors at the top 50 schools in the US are black, despite black people making up more than 12% of the nation's population, we can't explain that away by saying, I guess black people just don't choose to pursue chemistry. We can see from the data that black students are actually slightly overrepresented in the first year of college, and a good chunk of them graduate with chemistry degrees. But their underrepresentation increases at each level of earning a PhD, becoming a postdoc, and getting a professorship. And just in case you're wondering whether that data is time averaged and wouldn't show if things had improved and maybe they're actually better now, they're not. And in some fields it's actually getting worse. But all these graphs and numbers, they don't really tell us what the problem is. They illustrate that black students who pursue STEM are less likely to make it than white students, but they don't give us any information as to the cause of the leaks, so to speak. This is actually a common criticism of the leaky pipeline as a model. As a metaphor, leaking implies passivity, but the reasons for underrepresentation are anything but passive. Some geoscientists have proposed an alternative model where they describe the path to a STEM career as a vicious or hostile obstacle course with barriers that have been put in place to slow down or exclude certain groups, which, while maybe a bit more dramatic sounding, does do more to guide our attempts at solutions. If the problem is leaks, then we can just shove more people into the pipeline to compensate. But if the problem is obstacles, then we actually have to examine why those obstacles exist in the first place. So to iterate on our zeroth order pipeline model, let's take a look at some of these obstacles. <laughs> Now my goal here is not to explain every cause of every leak in the pipeline. It's outlining enough to think about it productively. So to keep it simple, let's put everything into three buckets. Initial conditions, K through 12 education, and higher education. I know, buckets, pipes, uh, don't worry about it. So to start, I don't think that most people need convincing that the better funded your school is, the better your educational outcomes, right? When publicly funded education is invested in via building schools, increasing teacher salaries, or distributing resources to schools serving low-income students, Test scores increase across the board, and this makes perfect sense. Without adequate funding, schools have to deal with overcrowded classrooms, it's harder to hire qualified teachers and counselors, they might not have enough books or other materials that are needed for classrooms, etc, etc, all of which have very tangible impacts on student learning. So if you're raising a kid and want to set them up for success, but you don't have the ability to pay the gratuitous amounts of money required for a private education, you're going to want the place you live to have well-funded public schools. But here's an interesting quirk about public schools in the US. The majority of American students go to school in racially concentrated school districts. And this isn't a separate but equal kind of situation. On average, non-white school districts get $2,000 less per student than white school districts which is a lot considering the national average per student is 13,000. And before you try to argue that it's just a class thing, 
Poor non-white school districts receive almost $1,500 less per student than poor white districts. Now, one of the main reasons this racial gap in the funding of public education exists is because public schools are largely funded through property taxes, and America has a history of something called redlining. This really great video from Frank Laundrie explains how FDR used the New Deal to build up just enough of the white middle class to prevent a socialist revolution, but strategically denied black Americans the same opportunity for prosperity through the establishment of government agencies like the HOLC and the FHA. The HOLC created maps like this one. Whoa, that's redlining right there. What the fuck, Franklin? The green being first grade, the best, blue second, yellow third, and red fourth. The worst of them all. If black people were living in an area, boom, instant red. Instant red, like that episode of The Button. Nice to meet you. You too. You too. Instant! While the HLC did still help homeowners in red zones, it set a racial president that black people just for being black were higher risk borrowers. A racial president that the FHA couldn't wait to remix. The Federal Housing Administration appraisal standards included a whites only requirement. I know, America was racist all along. Who would have thunk? Basically, to determine who was likely to repay their loans and therefore safe to lend to, the government used a very objective list of criteria that included the literal presence of black people. And I know why some of you might be thinking, sure, that's history, but what's stopping black people today from just moving to better neighborhoods? Well, besides the fact that it's kind of ridiculous to tell somebody that if they want a good education for their kids, they're just gonna have to leave their home and community for a potentially less welcoming environments, housing discrimination is also a thing that exists. Audit studies on housing discrimination, which is where researchers have groups of white and black people go, for example, apply for a bunch of different apartments and then look for trends in the results, have found that black people experience housing discrimination in about half of their attempts to buy or rent housing. And just to make a quick point while we're on the topic of illegal discrimination, the existence of whatever kind of anti-discrimination law does not actually mean that that kind of discrimination can't happen. We can definitively prove that discrimination happens when we look at the statistical trends in this type of audit-based research, but it is extremely hard for an individual person who is being discriminated against to actually prove it in a court, especially considering that little pesky part of Title VI where it says it's specifically intentional discrimination that's not allowed. And I think we all know how possible it is to prove racist intention. So between historic redlining practices that shepherded black residents into areas with low property values and the modern housing discrimination that keeps them there, black children disproportionately find themselves stuck in school districts with increasingly underfunded schools, setting them up for failure from the start. And it doesn't get much better from there. While there is truly no shortage of racial issues in K-12 education, today I'm just going to focus on the school-to-prison pipeline or the disproportionately high numbers of students from disadvantaged backgrounds, especially black and brown students, that end up incarcerated. The aforementioned disparities in school funding is part of this problem. Unmet educational needs have been shown to lead to disengagement, dropouts, and court involvement. But again, there are actually more factors at play than just income inequality. One of the biggest factors is the ubiquity of zero tolerance policies, which are mandated, strict, punitive measures for particular offenses regardless of the gravity of behavior, mitigating circumstances, or situational context. In other words, it's a predefined list of problem behaviors that are the grounds for either suspension or expulsion, no questions asked. This is actually a really good example of how a policy can initially seem reasonable, but can be leveraged to preferentially expel or suspend black students for talking out of turn with zero due process. Zero tolerance policies were initially introduced to address real problems like gun violence, and were the norm by the 90s when the government decided to withhold public funding from any schools that didn't both have a policy and agree to report all infractions to local law enforcement. Over time, these policies grew to include less severe infractions like tardiness or disruptive behavior, which were met with the same strictness as the more serious offenses. And eventually, minor infractions began to make up the majority of what was punished under these policies, with one study finding that 95% of out of school suspensions in 2006 were for minor, nonviolent infractions. The kicker here is that when it came to objective offenses like smoking or vandalism, 
white students were actually referred more often than black students. But when it came to more subjective offenses like disrespect or loitering, black students were referred more than white students. So we've gone from reasonable sounding gun control to empowering racist teachers to expel or suspend any black student they deem to be acting disrespectfully. And not to lay it on too thick, but this whole school to prison pipeline thing takes on an extra sinister dimension when considered in conjunction with a particular problem in disability justice. In his video on neurodiversity in the black community, Tayo from the channel Color Mind explains an apparent contradiction between the fact that black children exhibit symptoms of ADHD at higher rates than white children, but are 70% less likely to receive an ADHD diagnosis, resulting in their behavior being interpreted not as the result of an ADA-recognized disability, but as defiance. One reason for this discrepancy may be how black children, both boys and girls, who exhibit ADHD symptoms tend to be seen by their educators. Welcome the class clown, Deontay who play too much, Quran who doesn't have home training. You, if you know, you know, right? You, you know a Quran, for real. Oftentimes children who disrupt the classrooms are dealt with reactively instead of proactively as a problem to be solved swiftly and often as punitively as possible not as a person with a set of circumstances that lead to a set of behavioral tendencies. I'm so glad that Yusuf included that joke. Tayo goes on to explain how, without the formal diagnoses of their white counterparts, black students who exhibit ADHD behaviors are interpreted as defiant, labeled as troublemakers, and for the reasons we've already discussed, disproportionately end up in the juvenile or criminal justice systems. A misdiagnosis to prison pipeline, if you will. So many pipelines. And all this criminal justice stuff isn't even the whole picture of racism in K-12 education. Even if black students end up in circumstances where they don't have to worry about literally getting arrested in school, there's still all that classic educational microaggressive stuff. There's tons of research that shows that being a black student in a predominantly white environment has demonstrably negative effects on learning and performance. But we will have ample opportunity to talk about those kinds of things in this next bucket. Oh boy, where to start? First, there's the massive problem of barriers to entry, a good example of which is the continued use of standardized testing in admissions decisions. I explained this in more detail in a video I made on diversity in STEM, but to recap here, the SAT, which is the main exam used for college entry, is both both biased against black people, which means that they on average score lower, and also not a good determinant of college success. People tend to only pay attention to the first part of that statement, but pay attention to the second part. Not a determinant of college success. It's biased and it doesn't work. Researchers have found that the SAT measures only about 18% of the skills that influence first year grades, and even less of what influences subsequent grades, graduation rates, and professional success. So we're already off to a bad start. Past the racialized gatekeeping, there are the social effects of being a racialized minority. Stereotype threat that decreases academic performance, social ostracization from peers blocking study group opportunities, and of course, the professors who project their biases onto students. Seriously, that last one's a doozy. The degree to which professor biases dictate their student outcomes is wild. So college entry is biased against black students. College education quality is biased against black students. But I think maybe the worst part of the whole racism in higher ed bucket might be how universities are literally grifting students in the process. Here's Victory, the creator, laying out this grift in his video on the college industrial complex. What? The college industrial complex, a system in which higher learning institutions center capital, elitist values, and or the ability to uphold the status quo over the education of their students. Who? Literal children. Literal children, aka unsuspecting high school graduates and GED recipients. How? It centers capital by forcing higher learning institutions to utilize unsavory tactics such as the misinforming of prospective students in order to stay in business and make profit. It centers elitist values because of a few reasons. Definitely go watch the rest of the video, not only to hear his reasons, but also to hear these really great conversations he has with a bunch of different black content creators about their experiences in academia. There's something about extremely smart people saying woefully dumb things on a constant basis that is very disheartening and exhausting. Facts. 
So Victory explains how the college industrial complex perpetuates this belief that a college education is your guaranteed ticket to economic prosperity, despite the reality we live in where there are tons of college graduates who are under or unemployed, and the fact that many of them will probably be in debt for the rest of their lives because of it. On the surface, this might not seem like a racialized thing, but of course, we have to consider some context. In a book called The Trouble with Passion, Aaron Check argues that our cultural obsession with advising students to follow their dreams perpetuates an qualities of race and class by being much riskier for some groups of people than others. Following your passion is more likely to lead to stable and satisfying employment if a person has safety nets, like a family that can provide financial support, and springboards, like cultural or social capital that provides opportunities. Both things, notably, are not distributed equally in society. So between this ideal of following your passion at any cost, the predatory practices of the college industrial complex, and the relative lack of financial security and other resources available to black people in America, things don't look good. It gets even darker when you add in the fact that in America, if you serve in the military, the government will pay for education, which is why 75% of US veterans report enlisting in order to receive educational benefits. Also, black people, especially women, are overrepresented in the military. If you're wondering why the government still won't forgive student loan debt, pretty sure it's this. It's wild how seemingly separate institutions affect each other like this. Like, in this discussion of education alone, we've brought up the housing market, the criminal justice system, and now the military. But it also makes sense. None of these institutions are isolated. Education is in this interconnected system where all the different pieces are working towards the same end and probably reifying each other in the process. It's systemic. But let's pause on that conclusion just for a second. I've known a lot of people in academia who basically have the understanding of systemic racism that I've outlined here so far, who you know, are very well-intentioned, very vocal about their anti-racist values, and that's all well and good. But there's actually still an important piece missing from this model that renders these people's desire for systemic change pretty useless. And that is the existence of feedback loops. <laughs> It's kind of funny how scientists seem to forget about feedback loops when it comes to social phenomena, considering how necessary they are for describing scientific phenomena. Feedback loops are what we call it when causes and effects form a circle. Let's say you got a rocky little planet with some ice caps, and for some reason some of those ice caps melt. Now more of the dark surface is exposed, it absorbs more sunlight, the temperature increases, next thing you know, more ice melts. And then more surface is exposed, and then more light is absorbed, and then the temperature increases even more, and more ice melts, etc. 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 Feedback loop. But while a feedback loop can certainly run away, it can also be reversed. Like we could stick some mirrors all over our hypothetical fireball destined planet, it will be more reflective, therefore absorbing less light, and the temperature will cool, which will make more ice form, which will make the surface even more reflective, which will cool the temperature further, which will make more ice form, etc. 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 Feedback loops. And eventually all those little mirrors you put out aren't even necessary because the feedback loop has reinforced itself. Basically, feedback loops are why affirmative action is a good idea. So let's look back at the pipeline, but this time we're going to outline some feedback loops. I would have wanted to start at the end of the pipeline, but in reality there is no end. The experience of minoritization and the impacts that has on a person and their work don't just end because you're a professor or something. But let's just simplify and say our higher red bucket is the end. Professors who make admissions and or hiring decisions are, to an extent, determining the racial makeup of their workplace by deciding who is in their department and on a longer time scale, who's in the field. At the same time, they are affected by the racial makeup of their department and their field via something called white habitus. In a thoroughly data-driven piece of scholarship on race in the US, Eduardo Bonilla Silva defines white habitus as a racialized, uninterrupted socialization process that conditions and creates whites' racial taste, perceptions, feelings, emotions, and their view on racial matters. The basic idea is that when white people are segregated from people of other races, and in the US, they generally are, the tendency will be for them to develop negative beliefs about the people they're segregated from in order to be able to explain the segregation as something other than segregation. So in the context of academia, what this means is that white people in predominantly white STEM departments, consciously or not, will likely explain the lack of diversity around them as minoritized people being fundamentally bad or uninterested in science. And these often unspoken and generally incorrect explanations for why there are no black people around 
go on to prop up cultural beliefs like meritocracy that obscure this perpetuated bias from view. So if white admissions officers preferentially let in people of certain races, therefore determining the racial composition of their workplaces and fields, they'll have whatever negative beliefs they're operating under reinforced by the segregation they literally imposed on themselves. Feedback loops. Let's look back at our K through 12 ed circumstances that feed into the higher ed, where we talked about the ways discipline is employed to siphon black students out of class classrooms and into the criminal justice system. One patch for this leak, so to speak, is hiring more black teachers. A large body of research has shown that black students having experiences with black teachers produces a wide range of positive outcomes. For example, connecting back to our point about discipline, black students who have black teachers experience reduced rates of exclusionary discipline at every level from elementary to high school, which in light of our school to prison pipeline is a very good thing. Unfortunately, American public school teachers are mostly white. Disproportionately so, it's like 80% in the teacher population versus like 60% in the general population. And go figure, black people are underrepresented as teachers by nearly a factor of two. Knowing what we know, it would be only logical that if we were interested in improving the educational outcomes of black students, we would want to hire more black teachers. But, unless you're in Florida, teachers need college degrees, so their racist practices preventing black people from earning degrees in higher ed are stymieing our ability to diversify the body of teachers, thereby reducing racist practices in K-12 ed. Feedback loops. Finally, let's revisit those initial conditions. The things like housing discrimination that set black people up for suboptimal educational experiences before they even start school. There are a lot of ways that having a degree can make it easier to change those things. You need a degree to be a lawyer who advocates against discriminatory practices in court, or a writer of public policy who rethinks the way a city funds education, or a mental health clinician who provides pro bono services to in-need parents. The the list goes on. Credentials are helpful. Which is why I was so upset by this study whose primary finding was literally that white admissions counselors are more responsive to black students who present as deracialized and racially apolitical than they are to those who evince a commitment to anti-racism and racial justice. Basically, they did one of those audit studies where you send hundreds of letters from fake students to admissions officers and measure response rates, but instead of changing the race of the student, they changed whether or not the student talked about race in the letter. So like, one set of letters was from a fake student with a black sounding name who wrote about their commitment to saving the environment from climate catastrophe, while the other set of letters was from a fake student with a black sounding name who wrote about their commitment to African American liberation. Can you guess which group the admissions officers were more amenable to? Can you guess why? This finding is really interesting in and of itself. It speaks volumes to the way superficially progressive diversity agendas function, where the goal is to look as diverse as possible while still maintaining the values and hierarchy that created that lack of diversity in the first place. You know, we really do want black students, just not the ones who are gonna make their race like a... Thing. But in the context of our broader system, what this study is telling us is that at the point of college entry, the education system is literally screening for people that would challenge it. Like reactionaries who talk about there being no diversity of opinion in universities are like kind of right, but not in the way they think. It's this. In order for a black person to gain access to the power conferred by academic degrees, whatever that is, but it's certainly something, right? They have to at least pretend not to be interested in disrupting the racial order. Which means that the people who would theoretically go all the way through the pipeline because they just bootstrapped so damn hard and then take their education and go back and use that to improve the initial conditions that made the leaks in the first place, those people are being preferentially leaked out themselves because of higher ed gatekeeping. <sighs> Feedback loops. So there are a few different takeaways I hope we can get from this model we've built up. One is that while on some level, yes, systems are institutions and policies and stuff like that, on another level, they're just people. At every single point in our model, there needed to be some person, whether a realtor or a teacher or a college admissions officer, who was there to perpetuate the system. And it just so happens that a lot of them have biases in the same direction. That is a direction that disadvantages black people over white people. Puts people like me somewhere in the 
middle, depending on how we behave. This is one of the points that Bonilla Silva uses to describe what it means for racism to be systemic. It emerges from the collective effect of many people's potentially unnoticed but nonetheless default racist tendencies that seem just like the normal way of doing thing and not any particular choice. Hence the title of his book I keep citing, Racism Without Racists. The other point that Bonilla Silva uses to describe what makes racism systemic is that it reproduces itself and therefore doesn't go away with time. In terms of our model, this means that the system creating racial disparities in education isn't a one-way flow it reinforces itself. Underrepresentation in higher education is not solely the result of racism in K-12 education, it is simultaneously the cause of it. Every point within the system has the capacity to perpetuate or interrupt the rest of the system. And then this system goes on to interact with other systems. Education apparently interfaces with housing and criminal justice. Science education affects science policy, affects science industry. Racism intersects with sexism or ableism. Just a whole big mess of systems reproducing each other in this self-perpetuating blob of misery. And excuse me for being a very literal physicist about it, but the boundary we draw around something when we call it a system is only theoretically separate from the whole rest of the universe. In reality, absolutely everything is constantly interacting with absolutely everything, which is a bit overwhelming, right? Like, what do we do with all this information? How does anything change? I think we could use an intermission after all that. Take some deep breaths. Have a sip of water. Hydrate yourself. Maybe stretch a bit if you're feeling tight. Do whatever you need to do to just unclench. Maybe go outside for a little. I think I'll do that, actually. While we're on our break, I wanted to mention my Patreon real fast. It does feel a little weird to self-advertise in the middle of this conversation, so maybe if you're feeling generous, go donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund first. Send something to help the forest defenders stop Cop City if you can. It's a massive issue right now for American racial and environmental organizing. If you've done that and can still spare a few dollars, consider joining my Patreon, which, while definitely not the revolution, does help me out a lot. This video has taken me months to make, and I'm hoping to start making videos full time soon, which is something I can only even conceive of because of my wonderful Patreon supporters. They've all pledged a few bucks a month to support my work, which I am eternally grateful for and humbled by. And as a small token of my appreciation, I put up any extra content I make there. Q&As, interviews, little updates, things like that. No worries if that's asking too much. You know what's best for you. We all got bills to pay. I'd appreciate it if you're able, but I also just appreciate you being here. So have a little break, take care of yourself, and let's get back to it. Chaos is God's most dangerous face, amorphous, roiling, hungering, shape chaos, shape God, act, alter the speed or the direction of change, vary the scope of change, recombine the seeds of change, transmute the impact of change, seize change, use it, adapt. Bro. So now for the part everyone's actually here for. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? A few caveats before I get into this. First of all, everything I've talked about so far has been anti-blackness specifically, but this next part of the video I've tried to make not specific to any particular systemic issue, which means some amount of generalization, a pretty significant amount of generalization. So there's necessarily going to be a lot of gaps you're filling in yourself. A lot of the examples we look at are still going to be related to racism and or education, but the concepts are generalizable to different contexts. Also, I should clarify that my goal isn't to like 
say what should be done in the abstract. I'm pretty uninterested in debating what some theoretical powerful person should do. I want to give you a theoretical framework to think about how you can contribute to what it is that you care about. However, each of you are unique individuals for whom the answer to how do I change X system will be different. So again, generalizing. You're gonna have to fill in some gaps yourself. We'll go through this in a sequential-ish order. If you're newer to this kind of thing, you might find value in the earlier parts, and if you're a bit more seasoned, I imagine the later points might be more useful to you. And finally, take everything I say with a huge grain of salt. I am but one silly little goose who has been trying to answer this question for myself, and I've done a lot of work to, you know, synthesize my experiences and knowledge and conversations with others into this digestible little list for you, but it is inevitably imperfect and incomplete. But, as will be a theme throughout, I am not going for perfect, I'm going for pragmatic. I just want to give you enough information to go out and do something with it. So here it is, here's the listicle. Top 10 tips for doing a systemic change. <laughs> Goddamn. Number one, update your understanding of how change happens. Before we start trying to do change, we first have to understand like how change happens. Unlearn the idea that big systemic social problems have a singular root cause somewhere that if addressed would fix everything. This one goes out to all the people who comment on my videos that the solution to everything is to simply abolish capitalism and like I don't exactly disagree but i don't find that useful as a concept it's very easy to make things like structures with a marxist way of thinking and then it's so large of a problem that your only option is to co-opt the state you have to then target the state because it's the only thing currently that's powerful enough to influence these systems quickly and that's a viable way to approach the, the situation to be clear but you really limit your options for doing things, I think, when you think of systems as these solid, rigid structures. Basically, if the criteria for the work you're trying to get involved in is will abolish capitalism, you're probably going to be disappointed. It's also easy to erroneously localize change in time. You know, like imagining a particular moment somewhere in the future where the big change will happen instead of seeing history as continuous and as us being in the process of making history in literally every moment. And this goes both ways. Whether I'm waiting for climate apocalypse or the people's revolution, I'm seeing change as a singular moment and not a continuum. It's easy to think of it this way considering how often history is taught as the stories of great men and we learn about the moments in which these great men changed the world. But this framework obscures the effort of all the other human beings preceding or supporting or resisting these great men and their big changes. Critically, it prevents us from seeing our role in the development of the world unless we can become one of these great men who can single-handedly overthrow the system. And since that's obviously unattainable for most of us, the alternative is to be a plebe waiting around for the revolution. Or in other words, do nothing, a choice which happens to be very helpful for self-replicating systems of oppression. So how else could we think about change? And a quote that helped me with that was just sort of, you make the biggest impact in the smallest spaces. So like starting small ultimately reverberates and make a larger impact. I am making the effort to see people and participate in things that I know are making a change, at least in my small corner of the world. And if everyone just works on their corner, like, wow, then the world is all the world is, the world is better. Adrian Marie Brown, a writer that has significantly influenced my own thinking about social change, conceives of social systems as fractals. How we are at the small scale affects how we are at the large scale. The micro affects the macro, as above, so below. However you like to say it, systems are feedback loops, so any point within them has the capacity to affect all the other points and therefore the system at large. We need to move from competitive ideation, trying to push our individual ideals, 
to collective ideation, collaborative ideation. It isn't about having the number one best idea, but having ideas that come from and work for more people. This is from her book, Emergent Strategy, which is basically like a how-to organizing guide from a deeply human perspective. And it was a really valuable read for me. I definitely recommend it. But if you're trying to get a sense of this framework without reading a whole book, you can get the gist in this essay by scientist slash organizer slash educator Dr. Aisha Khan called Revolutions Are Made Up of Ordinary People Like You and Me. Within this framework, it makes less sense to ask what should the hypothetical great men do to change the world and a lot more sense to ask how can I contribute to the collective effort of changing the world? And that, I think, is the question that we should be trying to answer. Number two, know you're complicit, but that means you have power. I've heard so many conversations about social change that get stuck in this place of, well, am I actually that much a part of the problem? So let me help you get past that part. Assume yes. I won't even say anything about identity, just like across the board for whatever system you're considering. If you're wondering, assume you're part of the problem. For example, if you're an American or in America, you pay taxes to this country. And I don't know if you know this, but the government does some pretty awful things with a lot of our tax money. And as much as I would love to just opt out of that, Lauren Hill tried it, it didn't work, and I don't want to go to jail. So I'm stuck bankrolling this shithole of a country and am therefore complicit in every Every shitty system it perpetuates. God bless America. <laughs> I don't think I have the right to sit here and tell someone that they are obligated to care about a given social issue and frankly I wouldn't want to but what I will say is that if if your moral logic makes you responsible to help fix problems you contributed to causing then when it comes to social systems it's generally just going to be more productive to assume you're part of the problem which sucks right none of us want to be complicit in the horrors of the world but the silver lining to realizing that systems of oppression rely on people like you and me to perpetuate them is also realizing that that means they need us the people who benefit from the systems that hurt the people that you know that hurts you they right. want you to give up right like if you give up they win like you're just yeah. doing what they want if your participation in it wasn't extremely important we wouldn't have cops you wouldn't be forced to do the things and other things that fall outside of the system's requirements would not be illegal if your behavior wasn't needed to make it happen just to be clear I'm not saying go do crimes. I can't say that, the algorithm's listening. I've never gotten a video demonetized for content, but if any of them, it's gonna be this one. There are subtler, squishier internal things enforcing our system supporting behavior in a similar way to literal law enforcement. You know, the panopticon and all that, the cop inside your head. He's also a best. When I decide to do something, it is both informed by what culture has told me is acceptable, and then also a little bit of what I wanna do myself. Yeah. But I recognize that the system is what gives me the options of what I feel I can feel. Socialization is very much a thing, and not to sound too mind control -y about it, but in the same way that the state needs laws and police to enforce our behavior into supporting it, social systems train us to enforce our own minds into supporting them. Challenging that's not easy, but it's possible, and it's certainly more tractable than tax evasion. So the takeaway here is that you are part of the problem, but that means you have power. And if you learn how a system is influencing you to use your power, because it absolutely is, you can then learn how to exercise your agency instead. And not the fake agency of pretending to pick which septuagenarian is going to superficially represent leadership in this joke of a country, the real agency of choosing something the system isn't offering you. Number three, learn enough to get involved, but don't get stuck. In order to recognize how socialization within a particular system is influencing your behavior, you're going to have to go learn about that system. Which feels very duh, but apparently some people believe you can just start spitballing solutions to a problem you don't understand and it'll be fine. Shout out to the physicists who make everything in life a goddamn Fermi problem. The tricky bit is that understanding systemic issues can be pretty difficult by design. Social systems have a very specific way of making you able to feel something is wrong but like also not giving you enough language to describe what the oppression is. I could feel people being homophobic. Mm -hmm. I could very much feel 
even myself being fat phobic. I could towards myself. I would feel like this sort of like dissonance between what I wanted to do and the things that I was actually doing, but I didn't have language to describe it. It can be difficult to find productive dissenting opinions, to parse them and figure out how that information relates to your life. But once you do that work, you kind of gain this superpower where you can see all of the things you used to think of as benign for what they actually are. Kind of like that movie with the guy who finds the glasses that lets him see the subliminal messaging behind advertising and there's like aliens but they're trees is that the same movie i don't know i haven't seen either of them being able to see those hidden messages of why things operate the way they do is a necessary step to even wanting to do anything about it if you know nothing about, about politics you're like what do school lunches have to do with property values because i mean like one's real estate and the other one's education until you realize that the reason how schools are being funded being funded are, is through, sorry, uh, property taxes is a result of systemic discrimination right. in a way that would make you seem, make you think is innocuous, but is very, very deliberate. So do some research and learn about the thing you want to change. Come on, scientists, I know you know how to do research. However, I must also give a warning here. Anyone who spent any time on the internet can probably tell you too much information can be both addicting and debilitating. There are people halfway across the world that are dying right now and there's nothing I can do about it. That shit makes you feel awful. Like what, like, I have no, I, I can't do anything about that. I can barely do shit about like what's happening in my country. I can barely do shit about what's happening in my city. It's a really weird like recurring hamster wheel of damn shit is awful. I can't do shit about it, but let me watch another informational. I know we all joke about doom scrolling, but information overload is a well-researched phenomena that has some pretty harmful outcomes. Being inundated with a continuous stream of fear-mongering news has been shown to mislead people into thinking whatever problem is a lot worse than it actually is and makes people too scared to confront the issue. It encourages avoidant behaviors like social isolation and discourages potentially productive behaviors. It can even damage cognitive abilities like decreasing focus or impairing one's ability to make decisions. I'm pulling all this info from a book called Laziness Does Not Exist where Dr. Devin Price breaks down the often harmful effects of buying into cultural myths about laziness. In this case, the laziness of not being perfectly up to date at all times on every problem in the world, and he gives concrete steps for countering them. In this case, the advice includes using filtering, muting, or blocking options on social media generously, having real-life conversations about the news with people you actually know, not reading the news before bed, and just getting comfortable with not having to know everything at all times. If I were to add a tip to this list, it would be work on your discernment of the media you consume. How does it make you feel? Does it enlighten you, inspire you, agitate you into action? Or does it make you feel scared and hopeless? Does it make you want to stay in your room learning more and not seeing real people? So yeah, you're gonna have to learn some stuff without a doubt, but pay attention to whether your learning is adding to or taking away from your sense of agency. Number four. Imagine the world you actually want to bring about. I guess maybe systems are just confined imagination. Systems yeah. give us the sandbox by which we then believe that we are experiencing freedom or experiencing autonomy. I've heard artists talk about the drive to create art as deriving from either the fear of what would happen if you didn't or the love of what would happen if you did. And I analogously see two approaches to activism, one that focuses on reform to make the system less bad, and one that looks for new ways of existing, concurrent to, outside of, or after the system. The former fixates on what we don't want, and the latter on what we do. And don't get me wrong, making something that already exists less bad can absolutely be worthwhile. But limiting your thinking to the systems that already exist can only tell you what you don't want. What do you want? Not capitalism is barely a political opinion. That's just a statement of a thing you don't like. It doesn't drive you anywhere. In order to identify what it is you do want, you're gonna have to be able to imagine something different. A kind of delusional belief is necessary to get to where we want to go. Because every point of progress in our history, there was a point where it couldn't have even been imagined. And instead of taking that this, the impossible happened, I think at times it's easy to kind of take those moments for granted, forget 
you know, the, the historians and the revolutionaries that came before us and the imaginations they had to um, sit in and stand in in order to get to where we are. So without sounding like I'm telling you to like literally ignore reality, maybe it'd be just like a teeny bit delusional. Not a lot, just enough to imagine a world you'd actually want to live in. Like here's an example. We all know about capitalist realism, right? It is easier to imagine an end to the world than an end to capitalism or whatever. And sure, it is pretty hard to imagine, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. Case in point, the Freedom Farmers Cooperative. Basically, instead of fleeing to the North after Jim Crow laws made the South pretty much unlivable for African-American farmers. Some of them refused to leave, organized themselves, and built a community dedicated to their own self-sufficiency outside of the exploitative mainstream society of 1969 Mississippi. These farmers, these cooperatives in the American South, were creating spaces removed from neoliberal capitalism. They did not operate on a capitalist mindset. They did not operate on a capitalist underpinning they were not that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, people that were in these cooperatives got food when they needed food. People that were in these cooperatives got homes, they got protection, they got all of these things, and that is decidedly not neoliberal. I haven't read it yet, but I'm really excited to check out the book Freedom Farmers by Monica White, both because I really want to learn more about this amazing example of imagining and creating something outside of the system, but also because I'm just really into farming. Like, I didn't get this outfit as a bit. I look like this more often than I look like that. My point here is, don't give up on an idea just because you haven't yet figured out how every single detail of it will work. Don't fall into the traps of how will we pay for it or are they electable that cable news uses to frame any possible progressive change. Don't fall for the but what else could possibly exist arguments you'll hear from people who lack the imagination to think the world could be anything other than exactly what it is right now. Instead, experiment. Play the game of what if. Look to others who have been doing the work of imagining what a liberated world might look like. Like artists. Their job is to make the revolution irresistible, right? Afrofuturism and solar punk are literary slash artistic slash political movements that imagine futures in which black people and the environment respectively continue to exist. And even if it's fiction, having a model of the future you actually want will do a lot towards guiding your efforts at bringing it about. Number five, start by dismantling the system within. There was a story I heard a lot growing up about a man who wanted to change the world. So he goes out and he tries to change the world, but it was super hard. So he goes back and he tries to just change his country, but that was also too hard. So then he goes back and tries to change his town and then his family. And at the end of his life, he realizes that the one thing he should have started with, the thing he had the power to change all along, was himself. Starting with ourselves maybe seems kind of intuitive, but what exactly is it about ourselves that we're trying to change? I think for me specifically, my sort of journey of trying to figure out basically what the fuck is going on around me, I <laughs> it started very internally when I realized that I had a problem not only with the way that I treated certain topics and certain people, but I also had a problem with the way I was treating myself. As I said before, socialization is a thing. We live in a world governed by systems, and regardless of who we are, we've inevitably internalized them to some extent, even if we theoretically disagree with them. Like, I've known of educators who will take every opportunity to share how vehemently anti-cop they are, but then turn around and treat their students in the most punitive, surveillant, police-like ways, completely missing the irony. And I think it's worth pointing out that internalizing systems of oppression can be understood largely independent of identity. Like, I'm a woman, but I've absolutely held patriarchal beliefs that I've projected onto myself and other women and men and non-binary people for that matter. And those views have driven my behavior in ways that as the version of a feminist that I am now, I'm not proud of. So just like we did with the question of complicitness, let's just skip the debate and assume that to some extent we have internalized the logic of oppressive systems. By accepting this fact, we can move from learning about systems in the abstract to using that information to examine ourselves, to examine the judgments we make of ourselves and other people, the kinds of people who are or are not in our social circles, or the ways we rationalize the disparities we see in society. Hopefully, this self-reflection will illuminate the ways you can interrupt the systems within yourself and show you how you might change the ways you think, talk, or relate to others. Because if you want any chance of being able to change other people, 
you're gonna have to be able to change yourself first. And while we're on the subject of the self, friendly reminder to keep your ego in check. I am saying this as much for you as I am for me. Bonilla Silva's book ends with him giving advice to white people who want to know how to meaningfully challenge racism. And I think he really hit the nail on the head when he said, never forget that you used to believe all sorts of nonsense until very recently. And never forget that trying to change people requires tons of humility. The moment you begin believing you are better than others is the moment you need to begin doing a deeper level of introspection based. So humble yourself. Don't start by trying to go out and change everyone else. First, we must dismantle the system within. Number six, identify your role in a system so you can subvert it. All right, we've been doing a lot of learning and introspection. Let's start to think about outside of ourselves. Consider your workplace or your school or church or any organization that you're a part of. Whatever your role in that place is, there inevitably is a default way of doing it that doesn't challenge systemic problems. So it's on you to figure out how to subvert that. Here's an example. I've seen a lot of professors direct their ostensible anti-racist sentiment towards external things, say, have to stop, wait for the helicopter to pass. For those of you who are not in American urban environments, this is a normal thing for us because uh, we live in a police state. Listen to that freedom. <laughs> Where were we? Manifesting a better world. <sighs> I've seen a lot of professors who direct their desire to be anti-racist to external things, say outreach events, rather than taking seriously the idea that the way they run their admissions or their classes or their research groups may be contributing to racial disparities where they are. And while I'm sure that some of them truly believe they were just too powerless to do anything but pin the blame on external factors, I know they're wrong because I've seen what the alternative looks like. As a disclaimer, I didn't attend the program I'm about to talk about. I only read about it and I couldn't get a comment from current students. But based on everything I could find, it really looks like the applied physics program at the University of Michigan is a great example of what it looks like to utilize latent power. Long story short, this one department did a massive overhaul of their PhD program, designing it for inclusion from the inside out. They retooled their admissions process, their sense of the point of the degree program, and even their approach to community building. The result was a deeply interdisciplinary and student-driven program that in the last 10 years was responsible for graduating 10% of all black physics PhDs in the US. For context, there are over 200 institutions that grant physics PhDs in this country, and this one program that took seriously the project of anti-racism in education by changing things where they were is responsible for a full tenth of the black physicists to come out of the last decade. And while it couldn't have been easy, it was at least possible because they believed it was something they had the power to at least try. And this isn't something that just university professors can do. If you want to see a similar example of subversion, but at the K through 12 level, go watch the show Abbott Elementary. It's a mockumentary style sitcom, kind of like if The Office took place in an underfunded, predominantly black school in Philadelphia and was actually really funny. That's who runs the world, kids. It's a really impressive show for a lot of reasons. For one, the fact that it's wildly radical for something on network television. We all know how we have been taught to think about Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, but they were actually much more similar in their philosophies by the end of their lives than they were at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, people said they didn't get along, but that's not true. But also because it portrays the realities of teachers trying to do their best in a broken education system while simultaneously being a lighthearted and fun thing to watch. Can I just draw? Whatever it takes to keep you out of my hair. Sir, you are bald. It follows some teachers navigating an incompetent principal, a corrupt school district, predatory charter schools, and the general conditions of their and their students' lives. And through it all, they support each other to do right by their students. And when I say do right by their students, I don't mean that they dismantled white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. I mean that they did whatever they needed to slash could do to help their students. Earlier, when I was outlining the whole leaky pipeline thing, we could see how ultimately the system needed to be perpetuated by people in positions of power relative to students, like teachers and admissions officers and professors acting in biased but normal ways. The teachers in Abbott Elementary, just just like the professors at that Michigan program, understood their role in the system, the power that comes with that role, and then decided to do something different. It's funny, people have been asking me like, what job should they aspire to such that they have the most power to change whatever system it is that they're interested in? 
But I think my answer is like, do whatever job you like, you know, a job that's not going to leave you miserable and burnt out, and then figure out how to be useful from there. I don't think I had to sacrifice the dreams that I have for my life or the way that I want to live my life. But the thing that I can do is that within like what I decide to do, I can be an advocate for positive social change. If I am in a position where I decided to be a professional underwater basket weaver, and I have this grand audience of people who want to watch me weave a basket underwater, right? You better believe that as this underwater basket weaver, I'm going to tell people to respect trans people. So whatever your industry or passion or job is, you have some systemic power in that capacity. So learn to leverage it in favor of the causes you care about. Number seven, tap into communities, preferably in the real world. If you remember one thing from this list, let it be this. You cannot do this alone. Whatever massive systemic issue it is that you're concerned about, there are likely people not too far from you who are suffering because of it, and there are almost definitely people not too far from you who are already organizing about it. So go find them. For a start, maybe get to know the community that you live in. Do you know the people who live in your apartment building or on your street? Do you know what kinds of issues people in your city deal with? If there was a natural disaster where you lived, do you know who around could help you or who's really going to need some help beyond just like being a conscious member of your community doing some research on the place that you live can lead you to people in your area who are already doing organizing work that you can support whether with your time or your money for a more detailed how-to here's a piece from vice on how to find and join an organization pushing for the causes you care about again from Benia Silva, the historical record shows that fundamental change on race, class, and gender matters always requires a social movement. Although social movement work is slow, hard, and somewhat open-ended, it is ultimately the main vehicle for changing the world. He said it, not me. Join political organizations. I'm not going to tell you which one. It's not on me to choose your values. I'm just trying to tell you how to live your values. Local politics is another great avenue for community participation. Decisions at the local level generally have more of a tangible impact impact on people's day-to-day -day lives than who's the president. I have never been more checked out of a presidential election cycle than I am now, but I will tell you to vote in your local elections. It only takes a couple hours every few years to look up a voting guide that aligns with your values and literally do your minimum civic duty. But you could also attend city halls or petition for something you care about to be put on a ballot or canvas for a local candidate that you support. The really cool thing about this kind of grounded community work is that it can give you an avenue to affect change in a system that you otherwise don't have much power in. This was the logic of the Black Panther's free ch free children for breakfast. <laughs> oh jeez. This was the logic of the Black Panther's free breakfast for children program. They knew children were experiencing food insecurity and they understood how negatively hunger can impact the child's ability to learn. So to support the education of kids in their community, they just gave them breakfast. And what started as feeding just 11 kids in a church in West Oakland eventually became feeding 10,000 kids a day across the country. That is, before the FBI shut them down and the government ripped off their idea. And and that's not even to say that nationalization of your local community work should be the goal. People coming together to feed their community, for example, with a neighborhood garden, can be a radical act that has real impact. Like, it sounds ridiculous, right? Like, growing food is revolutionary, but it turns out that growing food is really fucking revolutionary. These are people who are growing food and having tangible impacts in their communities, right? A lot of them are giving the food away for free or at significantly reduced prices. A lot of them have like prepared meals programs where they're preparing meals for people to lessen that burden, specifically like black single mothers. And I emphasize trying to do this work IRL instead of online for a few reasons. First, because it just feels better. If you work at a local soup kitchen or at a, your neighborhood garden, that is when you feel good about participating in those kinds of politics. When you see the people that you're helping, when you smile in their faces, I think that is the difference between participating online versus actually participating in more tangible ways that make you feel good. I know that some people will react to that argument with some bullshit about how altruism is just the selfishness of wanting to feel good. But remember, I'm not interested in philosophical purity. I'm interested in getting things done. And if feeling good can help us get things done, then let's feel good. But besides just feeling good, there's a lot of utility in focusing on your physical surroundings. You can't attack systems globally. You can't even dissect systems nationally. Really, all systems are, are, are better 
um, for us to, to, to be thinking about attacking them on community and local levels, right? Things that the people that are in the room know exactly what we're talking about or have a, a vested interest or socially somehow held accountable to us in some way, shape or form. Your friend down the hall, your barber, whatever. A book that really helped me understand this was How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. I do realize the irony of the titles how to do nothing and laziness does not exist the subtext is how to be useless to capitalism which is often useful to humans tldr corporate social media is destroying our brains and relationships and democracies and not only does surrendering our attention to these platforms pad the wallets of the billionaires who own them but it also distracts us from the potential for interdependence with people we actually share physical space with the potential to as odell puts it resist in place to resist in place is to make oneself into a shape that cannot so easily be appropriated by a capitalist value system it means recognizing and celebrating a form of the self that changes over time, exceeds algorithmic description, and whose identity doesn't always stop at the boundary of the individual. She's an artist, so it's a lot of flowery language and metaphor that gets you there, but she does an excellent job of breaking down this idea of refusal in place in a way that left me with this overwhelming urge to go embed myself in communities in a way I had never felt before. Highly recommend. I think this book really helped me learn how to live my values instead of just claiming them as an identity. But as a real quick footnote to this point, I want to acknowledge that the advice of go participate in the real world won't work for everyone. Like I have friends who are just too physically disabled to go out and participate in local organizing, especially with organizations that don't use accommodations like masks or ramps to make their spaces more accessible. In light of that, I think there's a very rich conversation to be had about what productive online organizing looks like. I don't think I'm the right one to lead that conversation, but I hear disability Twitter is pretty good at that kind of thing. So here's a list I found of 28 disabled leaders you should follow on Twitter. Feel free to add further recommendations in the comments below. Also, there are definitely some ways that you can leverage online resources to get to the point of IRL organizing. You can follow local organizers on social media or look for activist meetups in your area or research your city and its history. The internet doesn't have to be a doom inspiring time sink. Just make sure you use it strategically lest it burn you out. Speaking of burnout, number eight. Hey, don't let the bigness of it all burn you out. I had a friend, he was like really, really active and he went to like a democratic convention and he came back and said something along the lines of, we need to do more. None of us are doing enough. You're not doing enough. That specific experience almost turned me off to the idea of like politics at all mm. or like social change at all. It can be really, really easy to get caught up in how big and challenging and never ending the project of social change is. And a byproduct of this is feeling like you can never do enough. And while feeling agency and responsibility can be very productive, constantly stressing that you need to be doing more generally isn't. For one, it can make you give up before you've even gotten anywhere. Research on climate grief shows that when we focus on how big and complex a problem is, we feel powerless and miserable. Whereas focusing on small, local, attainable steps we can take reduces anxiety and increases motivation. But there's another way that this insatiable feeling of I must do more can backfire, and that's burnout. Kathy Labriola, a counselor that works with activists and is a veteran activist herself, describes the inevitability of this burnout as she's seen it in her work. At any given moment in the last 50 years, there are lots of people saying, oh my god, this is the most important issue ever in history, and we must sacrifice everything for this cause. People said that exact thing 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago about different issues. And then they got so burned out after a relatively short time that they just dropped out totally from doing anything. I've known a lot of people who I've watched go from the most active, involved, move-making organizers to shells of their former selves because of the burnout that comes with making change work the unconditional center of your life. So the takeaway here is that we have to be discerning about how we engage in organizing. To this end, I want to share a question posed by Dr. Aisha Khan, who I had mentioned back at the top of this list. How can our lives and political movements be more sustainable and regenerative instead of just falling into cycles of productivity followed by burnout? She explores this question in an essay where she shares her experiences with two different kinds of organizing collectives that I think are great examples of what to look for and what to avoid when you're finding organizing to get involved in yourself. The first was highly organized and efficient and productive, 
but impersonal, spending every moment on getting things done to the point of not eating or taking breaks or even having the energy to get to know one another. That's one way of doing activism. Here's how she describes the other. I wasn't best friends with every single person that ever joined these groups, but we intentionally created a culture of care and would balance organizing campaigns or initiatives or events with just spending time together. We would spend late nights working over chai or chat over froyo or Persian ice cream, spend hours laughing together, sharing pieces of our past with each other, or crying in each other's laps and mourning our collective grief. Damn, I should probably say something about the grief, huh? Number nine, grieve what you can't change, which will be a lot. Isn't it strange to know something is like off, messed up, but like still be doing it? What about the cognitive dissonance that comes with like knowing something is wrong, but still doing it anyway? Through this whole list, I've been trying really hard to emphasize your agency and your power and your very real potential to do something that matters. But I'd be lying to you if I said that we could solve everything. The real, real reality of it is that there will always be things outside of our control. Systems we can't change, battles we won't win. And while I do think that it supports our sense of agency to focus on the things we can change rather than the things we can't, I don't think we can completely ignore the latter. Here's Dr. Devin Price one more time on the necessity of grieving the things we can't change. I can fight and fight to make the world more just but if my goal is fixing a decades-old problem or making it go away, I'm destined to fail and burn out. Sometimes, the best way to deal with those feelings of panic and guilt is to really let them wash over us for a moment and really accept that we're not fully in control or fully responsible for it. This can be an immensely sad experience, but it can also be liberating. When we mourn the losses that can never be brought back, we come to accept the reality we're living in. This allows us to address problems realistically and sustainably. If you're committed to making the world a better place, a lot of feelings like hopelessness and frustration and exhaustion are gonna come up. And while I've said that sitting in the negative can hinder your agency, ignoring a feeling isn't the same as getting past it. Sometimes we just need to feel our feelings in order to process them and come to terms with their very real causes. So practice accepting these feelings. Observe them, talk them out with comrades, and give them the respect they deserve. And then go watch an episode of Abbott Elementary with a friend over some ice cream and have a little laugh. Or whatever processing your feelings looks like to you. It's different for everyone. And once you've felt what you needed to feel and gotten back to an emotional state in which you can feel your agency again, Go out and do the damn thing. The only thing that I can control is the thing I do right now, today. And if I don't do it today, tomorrow I would not have done it. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now please stop asking me how to fix science. God is change. And in the end, God prevails. But meanwhile... Kindness eases change. Love quiets fear. In a sweet and powerful, positive obsession blunts pain, diverts rage, and engages each of us in the greatest, the most intense of our chosen struggles. I want to explain all these ominous poetry readings that have been sprinkled throughout this video. The three passages you heard are from Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, which I read for the first time during that year that I didn't leave the house. The story takes place in a world that's just a touch more dystopian than ours, uncannily so, and follows the survival story of a protagonist who's driven out of one of the last safe gated communities when it's destroyed and most of the people she grew up with are killed. It's a sad book, but it's good. But it's not the kind of survival story of being self-sufficient and making it on your own. She survives by kind of collecting people who have also lost their homes and or families into this ragtag group that help each other get by while also looking for a new way to live. And in doing this, she basically starts a religion that gives her and her followers not only a vision for a better future, but also a means to get there. And her whole religion is based on one core idea. The only thing you can ever count on is that things will change. And the absolute inevitability of this change is the basis from which we can form hope. I believe at times people co confuse hope and optimism. To be an optimist is to expect change without doing anything or expecting things to get better without you having to push anything forward. Hope is the vehicle 
through which you input action with the expectation that things will change. And that is the only guarantee of life, that things will one day be this and then the next day be something different. It might sound small, but sitting with this idea that all I can be sure of is the future being different than the present, with no certainty that it will be better, has brought about one of the most important shifts in my thinking that continues to be relevant in literally every area of my life. And when it comes to thinking about oppressive systems, understanding the nature of change via this fictional religion has helped me feel like a participant in politics rather than a victim of it. Because it's given me hope, and hope is a reason to do something. Being a doomer doesn't make you clever or rational. It is not the intelligent, big brain thing to assume the world is fucked and there's nothing we can do about it. Pessimism ultimately suffers the same ungrounded self-assuredness of the future as optimism. Because whether you're predicting utopia or apocalypse, you don't actually have any way of proving that you're right. We don't know the future. We can never know the future. And as terrifying as it is to admit that we are completely ignorant to what awaits us, it is in that foggy, gray, unknown space that a world beyond our wildest dreams can have the potential to exist. And it has to exist somewhere in here before it has any chance of existing out there. So my hope with that last story is to get you to see that change is always happening. Always has been always will. And every single one of us is always affecting and being affected by that change, no matter how small. So now it's on you to decide. Are you going to sit back and watch other people shape reality into what they want? Or are you going to get out there, live your values, and shape change yourself? Have fun! <laughs> A cat. Thank you for watching this whole video. It was a long one. It took me a long time to make. Shout out to my Patreon members who have stuck around so that I can continue. Oh, you want to go? Fine. I guess I can do the credits without the cat. So first I want to give a huge, huge heartfelt thank you to all the creators I collaborated with on this video. Dainty Funk, Color Mine, Victory the Creator, Bellamy Rea, Babilla. They're all wonderful people who I've had the pleasure of getting to meet through my work on YouTube who have so graciously lent their time and energy and effort to this project and I am so grateful to them for helping me with this. And you should check them all out because they're all fantastic creators who do really awesome work in their own right. I'm a fan of all of them. The artistry, the scholarship, the vibe, just all of it. Go check them out. And besides checking out their channels, if you want to see my full conversations with them because I talked to each one of them for almost an hour in order to get all those little snippets for this video, all of those full interviews are going to be on my Patreon, which you should check out as well. The people whose names are going by right now, those are the current subscribers to my Patreon. The way it works is you sign up and pledge a few dollars a month so that you can get access to this behind the scenes stuff like the full interviews and some Q and A's that I've done with questions that Patreon members have asked me. And I get to keep doing this as a job. Like as much as I would love to make stuff like this just out of the kindness of my heart, the reality is that I wouldn't be able to if I wasn't getting paid for it because I got responsibilities and obligations and medical bills and I am eternally grateful for anybody who has at any point for any amount of time supported the Patreon. You're the reason I'm here and the reason I'll be continuing to do this for at least a while. If you want to support my work but can't justify the Patreon subscription, you can do all the algorithmic things, like the video, leave a comment on the video, share the video with somebody you know, subscribe to my channel here on YouTube, hit the bell thing so you get notifications when I put up new videos. Also, if you're here from the Pluto video waiting for me to make good on the promise that I was going to do the whole facilitating some kind of conversation via comments on each video. I'm gonna come back to that on the next video. This whole how to do systemic change thing honestly feels very outside of my standard like science-y scholarship wheelhouse. So I'm going to return to that conversation in the next one where I'll share some of the comments from Pluto, which by the way, y'all, amazing comment section on that video. I am so humbled by the knowledge y'all have brought to it. And I'm excited to get into it. But yeah, next video, I'll share the Pluto comments and introduce a new prompt and keep that going because I really am excited about that. I just don't think this video was the right place for it. What else is there? Features, Patreon, algorithm things, comments. I don't know, I think that's it. But I have such a wonderful problem of having so many Patreon subscribers that I need to fill this time with something. We could appreciate some plants together. Let's do that. Let's, let's, uh, let's, appreciate, some, let's appreciate some plants together. Come
جميل في سماء I'm cured now. <laughs>